I am delighted to be here. I had a wonderful day of visiting with students and great faculty. And I was able to get refreshed by being with students who challenged me to think outside the box. And I think of myself as a you know, decent architect, decent designer. And I saw things today, many things, not just a few, many, many things that caused me to think, oh, well, I'm going to go back and look at this a different way. Or I'm going to go back and look at this a different way. And that is what's, this is what I envy about you all. You all get to do this every day. And for you professors and teachers and lecturers, congratulations. It's a dream job. It really is one of the greatest things you can do. And you students are really quite good. I am very impressed by what I saw today. And I look forward to seeing some more tomorrow morning. So I'm here to talk to you about sustainability. But as you're going to see, I'm not going to talk about sustainability, I don't think, in a way that you either expect or maybe very not necessarily uncomfortable with, but it'll, I hope to shift your thinking a little bit about things. I got out of college and I had a, a degree in psychology and sociology. And I went to work for a think tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And some of the projects we worked on were for a big house, you know, trying to figure out housing in Japan which had been basically destroyed during World War II, and they were still fighting their way out. And this is in the 70s. And so I got a lesson in how you think differently about a problem, and that stuck with me. I worked, one of my mentors was a guy named Bernard Mueller time, who was, who had no technical training. He was, a, he had studied medieval theology and had gotten his PhD in, in cracking the text of Meister Eckhart, a great medieval theologian. But he understood how to take apart a problem and turn it on its head and then to put it back together in ways that were surprising but also served the problem, so, uh, solve the problem. When we were working in Japan, I got very interested in Japanese architecture because this was going to be the model of the new architecture that we developed for the Japanese government that was going to be built in the United States and shipped over. And it was basically mobile homes by other means, uh, industrial housing. And from that, I fell in love with architecture, became an architect. But I never forgot the psychology and sociology that were at the core of my education and the problem solving that I did prior to that. We worked on water systems in Central Africa. We worked on a lot of things. But we worked with a lot of people who needed things that they had to have to survive. They had to have these to live, to raise their families, to pursue their spiritual life. And that has never left me. And so in architecture, we try to take an approach which looks a little more deeply at the problems that, that we are presented by our clients. And as designers, architects, engineers, other related professions, we try to solve the problem in a different or unique way, not for the sake of being unique, because uniqueness is not the end, but it's a means of getting to something that might be a little more elegant solution than you might have had otherwise. So in all of this, we've learned to listen more closely, look at the context more carefully, Try to understand trends that are behind what is causing your client to think differently. And think about the end user that is not yourself. Because most of what we all design as designers and architects is something we never inhabit. We ne didn't, certainly didn't pay for it. We're certainly not going to be in charge of its maintenance. But all of those things are part of what we have to think of as designers and architects. Uh, later on, I will get into why I think interior design is the most important profession, because it has more to do with supporting the human enterprise than any other discipline in the world. We're heading into a, and I'll talk about this as well at the end, but we're getting into a part where the edges between all the professions are collapsing at an enormously fast rate. And so teams are comprised more and more. And we did this at Forrest Perkins from the beginning. We put architects and interior designers right together. There was no architecture department or interior design department. 
we get better architects by putting them with interior designers. We get better interior designers by putting them with architects because they are they are consumed with different problems, but the overlap of their consumption is where the solutions generally are found. So, when I say beyond sustainability, um, oh, this should be interesting. I haven't done this yet. Uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't do that right. You know, there was a 50% chance, right? Okay. When we talk about sustainability, for everyone in the world, it is a matter of environmental sustainability. It is to create a sustainable future. Well, I would argue that we are well on the way to doing that, and we're doing it in record time, if 50 years is record time because we started a long time ago. But through a series of events and a series of processes and shifts in technology and markets and value and the willingness of the design community to lead, we've gotten there in a pretty good time. So we're winning back the battle for an environmentally sustainable future. We know what it takes. We've developed the means and methods to dramatically reduce consumption and waste. And most importantly, we've created a sustainable ethos of environmental responsibility and action that are, however, slowly being embraced globally. Now, the West is doing it faster than the East. Uh, the North is doing it faster than the South. But we are going to get there. They're going, there are a lot of bumps on the road. Um, there, the 70s in America are now the 20s in China. That's a frightening prospect because it is a, it's a huge problem and not an easy problem to fix. We won because the design press is effective. Uh, sustainability has kept a very important story alive for long enough to drive markets, drive change in manufacturing, transportation, and building waste. Advertising revenue-driven competition between manufacturers has meant that sustainability has been a durable story for 15 plus years, and by which magazines have done very well financially. No small reason that story stays alive thus enabling the exploration of the idea of sustainability to get traction. The long period of this run, and I would argue it's probably more than 15, it's more like 15 to 20 years, has also enabled longitudinal studies of operating cost. And it's not just the design that we all do. If you're not considering the operating cost of that system, then you've missed half the equation, I would argue, because that's where all the money is spent long term. It's not just, it, it, what we spend on the front end of a project is minuscule compared to what, is what it's going to cost to operate that facility over 30, 40 years, the life of that facility. So we can, uh, to tell a better life cycle cost story, enables facility owners to drive volume that reduces the original premium for sustainable products over time. We won because markets are efficient. It's easier to find, today it is easier to find cost-effective quality uh, building, pardon and misspelling, and FF&E materials that derive from sustainable or green manufacturing strategies than to find those that don't. If you go to any, any um, large convention, if you go to ASID, you go to AIA, you go to IDA, you go to any of these, big engineering, and particularly the MEP, the Mechanical Electrical and, uh, Electrical and Plumbing Conventions, you find that you can't find anything that's not. So we've effectively won. The cost of operating buildings has come down dramatically. The cost of building buildings has stayed steady and only incrementally increased with the hiccup of the 2008 downturn. But all major building product and ff &E manufacturers across all major building market, uh, building material and furniture, fixture and equipment categories now showcase products deriving from sustainable strategies. Not one, there's not one who doesn't. If you don't do it, you're out of the game because you cannot compete, because the demand is so high. All of our clients demand it. In Washington, you can't build a building that's not at base level lead. It's, that is the base level. So you, everything is up from there. And we're routinely doing silver, gold, and platinum buildings. So lead one. The cost premium for these products has been steadily diminishing and will achieve net parity soon. And net parity is the most important part. And we're seeing that price, that price premium has practically disappeared. And we're seeing new technologies that are come on, coming online that will make that price go below so that any other manufacturing process is going to cease to be market effective. So how long did it take for us to win this battle? The media sensed an environmental movement in the 60s. Cheaper publishing enabled the environmental topic to reach more readers. 
architects, interior designers, and planners ex began to explore environmentally responsive uh, design in the 70s. News sources covered environmental disasters, which reminded people what we're fighting for. And there were some pretty big disasters. I mean, this is, for everybody who is a student today, you did not live in a time when there were environmental disasters to speak of. I mean, I can't imagine. And these days they're rare. They, we see them reported, they're, they're foreign reportage more than they are national reportage. Hollywood sees a story and market opportunities for environmental, uh, environmentally themed movies in the 1980s. Social media scales the message to broader interest in action. In the 2000s, real property interests see that green drives value, more higher rent for the same product. Lead establishes a common standard for everyone to achieve. Manufacturers change product development strategies, growing scale of green material assembly and construction techniques, because it's not just the material, it's the way you actually build things. And that's, that's a very, very important thing as well. Contractors were the last guys to come on board, and now they are overwhelmingly, the biggest contractors in the world, do more lead work, the, the top 10 do more lead work than probably the, all of the rest combined. And so that's a pretty important thing. The premium cost of going green is reduced to near parity in 2015, and non-green products are harder to find. So, there's a new focus. And there needs to be a new focus because we've solved that problem. And I know that there are people in this room who will say, well, that's not true. We still have all these problems. Yes, but now we have the means and methods to do it. All we have to have is the individual will to, to buy it. And it's getting hard to buy anything that is not it. So I think that's winning. Okay, so now we must create a broader idea of sustainability that reduces ineffective compassion, heartless pragmatism, and so, now you can tell from that that I'm going with the left and the right, and supports and sustains the individuals, families, and our communities. Our new goals are to find sustainable solutions in fighting poverty, promoting equal opportunity, not equal outcome, and earned success, earned success being a critical path here, supporting healthy living and spiritual enlightenment, all to the big goal of creating a happy society, because we know that happy societies are societies that are more productive, there's less turmoil, there's less crime, People are healthier, happier. Happier is good. This is, I don't know if any of you ever saw this, is a group called the Hipster, the Hipster Conservative, and they all write under pseudonyms, so you never know who they are, but they generally tend to be people in the news. Um, the concept of sustainability must now be broadened to include culture, society, and the state of the human world. Moral ecology, moral and ethical foundations stable enough to sustain strong, diverse, and compassionate societies. Social sustainability, structures encouraging formation of strong, long-lasting units. And cultural conservation, approach to arts and letters tending to preservation and the cultivation of our common cultural heritages. I say heritages because there are many, particularly in this quilt that is America. And it's, it's the most wonderful, in my view, the most wonderful place on the planet. So, how do you, how do you write a program for a sustainable humanity? How, what are the tools for that? And I think they are design thinking, which we'll talk more in greater depth about, understanding the technical requirements for design, drawing out and listening to users' aspirations and needs, understanding the history of a place or setting in all of its dimensions and all of its warts, very importantly. No place has nothing but roses. Most places have roses with big thorns, and we tend to ignore the thorns when we look at problems because the roses are prettier and the thorns hurt. Draw design from basic sources, climate culture, patterns of views, design for delight that fosters happiness. And I will keep coming back to happiness as a theme. I think it's a very important idea that needs more and it's getting a great, there's a great deal of discussion about happiness in, in the think tank world these days. Don't design for yourself, design for others. Appreciate the fact that you're not paying for it and you're not likely to use it. And then, most importantly, go back and see your work. Go see if it's used as you thought it was going to be used. Go ask your clients whether they're happy with it, what disappointed you. There's so much to learn from going back, and frequently don't, we don't want to go back because we know there might be something lurking there that is unpleasant or that has not turned out well. You need to know that. And you need, for that, you need for that client to know that you know that and that you care about that. 
because that is the that is the ethos that we all should work from is that we care for each other and we care for our clients and we care for the work that we do not today but for as long as it's going to be there something called design thinking started showing up in the 1960s Herbert Simon thinking about it in the context of computers and there are generally two, two approaches for solving problems. There's a design method and then you know, scientific method. One is synthetic, the other is analytic. Uh, design thinking identifies both known and ambiguous key point, ambiguous aspects of a situation to discover hidden dimensions and alternative paths to the solution. Scientific method starts with defining all the clear parameters of a problem to create a solution. It's generally thought that designers, because of the way we're wired, are more likely to successfully engage in design thinking if they, if they embrace ambiguity and the interactive and iterative uh, process of design and are able to tangibly describe drawings, models, all of these, that describe choices that have the power to, incur, to engage communication, encourage communication. Because what we do well is talk about things and talk these problems out. And in so finding, we put the power of the greatest computers, God's greatest gift, to think about all these things together. And that is the true power of creativity. And there are those of us who, and there are many, who believe that design thinking is the path by which interior designers, architects, engineers, and others need to proceed in working in the world today. So how does this relate to happiness? How does this relate to a sustainable humanity? Design is a key. Design is the key, I would argue. Uh, you, I could equivocate and say, well, there are, many, there are many reasons that different things would be important to this as design. Now, I really do believe that design is the most critical thing because we're all in here. This, was a, this is a design space. Whether it works or not is subject to interpretation. Um, but all human activity, with the exception of the outdoors, which is by the best architect, happens in man-made spaces. We all design these. The men and women who inhabit the design professions did all of this over, and we've been doing it for thousands of years, and we'll do it for thousands more. The visionary designers and architects who have made the places that, that we find to be historically or emotionally most important to us were not necessarily designed by, they certainly weren't des designed by academically trained designers or architects. This, uh, these professions didn't exist before the 1880s. But there is a human need to make spaces into places that are imbued with value. And that value is what makes us appreciate, love, revere, feel more comfortable than any other place, cannot wait to get back, all of those human emotions that are attached to, to space, to built spaces that are become places. Research indicates, as it has been for a long time, and once again, that built environment and interventions are a necessary and transformative approach to promoting human health at both the individual and community scale. So what can we, as designers and architects, do to make a difference? If you look at the scale of all that we touch, and I've just listed just a few just in the interest of space on a, a blue screen, sectors impacted primarily by design. Well, all of the design of space for living, working, relaxing, worshiping, recovering, learning, doing nothing, not an unimportant thing, are all mixed land use, pedestrian infrastructure, bicycling infrastructure, street design, mixed income, mixed density, multi-generational housing, public parks, green spaces, public plazas, community facilities, public transit, building technologies, green architecture and design, sustainable infrastructure and in nature in cities, access to healthy food, and you're seeing the rise in community gardens at an amazing rate as people rush back to the city abandoning the suburbs, which is a, another whole problem that we have. And then the lifelong education to keep reminding us of why we like to be together and learn. 
The design objective of sustainability is creating places. And we, we have this profound need for place. And these are spaces that have become imbued with meaning. That vi these are the visible and tangible things that persist and endure. They anchor our memories in ways more substantial than thoughts or emotions. There is something, there is a, it, it is akin to a spiritual relationship with a place. We talk about the spiritual relationship we have with, with nature. If you stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon, you've seen that. If you're in Yosemite, you've seen that. If you're at any river, if you're outdoors and see these great plains that I saw coming down, you're always aware of these great spaces that now are inhabited as places. We all come from somewhere. And sense of place is one of those things that has been very important as long as we've all been around for the tens of thousands of years to understand what it is because we know what it isn't. And knowing what it is is a personal thing that, gen that is not infrequently shared with others who also believe that it is as well. And so we tend to congregate in these places that we enjoy, that mean something to us. Globalization, rapid globalization, demands that we get more of our places. We're seeing the destruction of a place in Syria that is causing people to find new spaces that they will then convert to places that they value. It's a very sad thing, but it's the, the, these sorts of migrations have happened over all of our human existence. They're tragic, they're sad, but humans are also adaptable and they're able to find a new way. It is wonderful that there are humans and human institutions that can ease the transit of these just terribly misfortunate people into places where they can be loved, cared for, achieve some spiritual care, be fed, be taken care of, have their health taken care of, and feel some love from a situation that is obviously a horrible situation. We don't understand that well enough in this country. Um, and then you could argue that a firmer sense of the sense of place is very important to our freedom. It is that which allows us the confidence to go forth and fight for the things that we believe are necessary to be free. More place, less space. To get this, we need to understand the phenomena of place. Uh, for those of you who are itinerant, you go back and forth from school to home or whatever, you, you remember that, that time when you were a freshman. And those of you who are freshmen who just got this, just got here, are keenly aware of this. How much do I take from home to make that room a place? Not just a space. I need to inhabit that space. How much do I take? When have I taken enough? When, and if I go back again, what am I going to bring? Because it's not place enough for me yet. And then when you leave it, and you, you have lived here for a year or so, and we all know this from having moved, we're, we're, we move around a lot, we're itinerant. You walk in that last time to see what you've forgotten. Everything is empty. That stain is still in the carpet. Those tack holes are still in the wall. And those will be gone soon. And that place, you will have given up to space again for someone else to come along and make it place. We need to think about how our understanding of that transition from space to place occurs. We know in real time, we frequently say, oh, we're talking in real time to China. Well, no, we're not. We're, we're talking in real time, but that, that person's in a place over there, and we're in a place over here. We're not across the table from each other. And even, even Skype kind of makes it virtual, but... It's, the lighting is always bad. You know. There's something lost and there's something gained in every new place. When you go to a new place, you lose the last place you had. But you gain something new, and there's always a sense, in most cases, except in the case of these poor people that we just talked about, there's an optimism that life is going to be different and better whenever we go someplace. So that is, that is what we are doing as we imbue this new place this, this new space with feelings and emotional connections that make it place. 
This is what we need to do as designers and architects every day of our lives. We need to imagine how we're going to take the 25th and 26th floors of an office building in Lexington and make them a place for a company to operate where everybody wants to be at work every day. That's not an easy job. That is not an easy job. Uh, we know that the cost of technology and globalization are, are frequently described as responsible for placelessness. There's a, a sociological term, Emile Durkheim, talking unfortunately about suicide, where he talked about anomie, the feeling that I have no place. And these are social conditions that can be solved by designers. Not solely, but we take a big role in that. We take a very big role and we take a very important role in it. And if we're successful, it looks seamless. If we're unsuccessful, we always get blamed. And then they'll try to charge us for it as well. But that's, that's a different story. But and then there's, this, there's also this notion of stepping in the stream. Does anybody know this expression, stepping in the same? You can't step in the same stream twice. Right? Because the water is always moving. I might be at the edge of a brook and I've put my foot in and I've stepped in the stream. Well, I can't put my foot in that same brook because that brook is also the water that is going by you. You can physically hit the ground that you may have hit before, but that, the water that you touched is, is gone away and is ready for somebody else to touch it. That's, that's another idea and a very abstract notion about place. So if I look at the role of interior design in place, as, as it's the, the setting for all human activity, how can designers meet the challenges of fostering place? Because that's ultimately, I would argue, that's, that's our job. That's what we do. We're, when we're successful, we will have fostered place. So the space that we shape becomes place, takes on a life of its own as a result of resonance and the shift from space to place. So we need to understand how lives are lived out in context. If we know that we're moving somebody from this house to this house, they're walking away from a whole place that is imbued with their most precious memories of holidays, of birthdays, of sickness, of, of ill health, and perhaps even death. We move somebody to a new office. We move a congregation to a new church. These are all, these shifts are not without psychic damage that we can make better by trying to understand what it is that they felt so strongly about in the place they were in and the place and how do we capture that in the place that they are going. And they're, they're perfectly willing to say, well, you know, I, I absolutely don't want that again. Perfectly reasonable. By saying what you don't want, you say what you might want. That's good. That's a data point for us. Um, we need to know what, historically what a place is. We need to know what happened someplace. We need to know, and I don't mean the, the president came through here or there was a war here, but we need to know the little things. There, there's a, a great piece of writing where a, an author waxes rhapsodic about the loss of a lease by a Korean grocer in New York. And he goes on for pages about how he remembered he had gotten to know that store so well that he knew where the seltzer water was, that he knew where this was, he knew where this was. He, if you've ever been in these Korean grocery stores in Manhattan, they're chock-a-block with stuff. You only get to know them over centuries. Mm -hmm. So this guy, he just goes on and on about missing a place because it shook up his world. He said, now I've got to go find another Korean grocer. I've got to learn that all over again. How inconsiderate <laughs> for that guy to close. You know. So understand history, understand natural features. The natural features of this landscape are unique. They're fascinating. There's so much sky. It is amazing. It is, I can't imagine that you can see the weather coming from a long way away. I live in Washington, D.C. You can't see beyond the trees because it's, it's very dense. It's a very dense fabric. Um, understanding how landscape shaped places is very important. This is on this exquisitely beautiful campus. These trees are amazingly beautiful. And what I like about them is that the way they particularize the landscape. You don't, you never see, you don't really get a chance, except at the edges, to see buildings old. I mean, excuse me, scratch, see buildings whole. You see fragments of buildings. I see a couple of windows here, I see brick courses here, I see a door here, I see this here. 
Walk around and think about what you see only by looking through the trees. And you rarely, in the historic part of the campus, you rarely see whole buildings. You just see fragments of buildings. But you know what that building looks like because gestalt psychology will help you understand that the human mind can take all these fragments, put them together, and you see a whole building. It's a brilliant thing that we have there. But that, because you can do that, means that those memories are also fractured memories that your mind can put together. What is going to be lost when you lose that? And for those of you who have left campus, and you've left campus and you've spent a wet time away and you come back, what is it that resonated? What is it that absolutely made you thrill? You know, that's a, those, are the, those are the things that you have to focus on. Those are the things we all, as designers and architects, have to focus on. This is the small detail that we talked about. Um, All of our all of our learning is individual. And so try to imagine what you learned in a change of your own from space to space and how you left a place, gained a place, and try to understand that. Try to figure out a language when you're talking about a project to understand what place is in that project the project on the 25th and 26th floors of an office building in Lexington. What is it about that building? What, what, why is it that, is it possible that I will create something that will allow an employee to look up and see in the windows at night a configuration of space that will allow them to say, oh, I work there. That's where I am. That's where I'll be tomorrow. Because then all of a sudden it has place. It's no longer just space. Robert Frost. This is the most wonderful quote. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than 100 years before we were her people. And then Wilfred McClay, who's one of my favorite writers, from a piece called The Space Was Ours Before We Were the Places. What is needed is a special kind of planning, one built around respect for the element of contingency, whose chief goal is the support and enabling of human spontaneity and creative possibility, rather than the inhibition or oversteering or overriding of them. The solution to oppressive and ineffective planning is a recognition that the best plans are those that renounce the aspiration toward comprehensive solutions and benevolent paternalism at the outset and are modest and tentative in their claim to understand final causes. Allow for things to change. Instead, move with caution and respect, leaving many matters tentative and many corners, un corners undeveloped, showing concern for the citizens they, as they actually exist, not as they can imagine to be, and showing solicitude for the energies of generations yet to come. Above all, building a sense of place on the foundation of present realities on the land of the living that is already here. When we design a building for the future, we don't design a building for the future inhabitants because we don't know who they are and we don't know what they aspire to. We design a place for the people who will be inhabiting it in the near term. Oh, and there's something that we talk about as architects and designers, which drives me to the edge. We always talk about the timeliness of a place. If anybody tells me that there's timeliness in their solution, I will tell you what time it started and what time it ended. It's pretty easy because we all rely on these things, that, these little gestures that we think, oh, well, this will be a timeless timeless gesture. It's not. Generally, everything has a time. Everything has a moment. You understand it. It, it happened. You're citing something. Most people are not original. Although I saw some original thinking today, most people are not purely original thinkers. There's no such thing as timelessness. Everything has its time. And it will not be timeless because the people in the future may not understand why at all, and they may have moved on from all the suppositions that we made about the space when we created it. This is from J.B. Jackson, who's one of my one of my professors at UCLA, and he was a crotchety guy. <laughs> he had a joint appointment at Harvard and UCLA, in Berkeley for part of that, and he would drive his, he didn't stop until he was 82, he would drive his motorcycle Harley across country every year.